Culture Bar, an arts and culture podcast series brought to you by Harrison Parrott. In our Speed podcast mini-series of quick insights into music and culture from around the world, we talk to music industry professionals about the music of their homeland to give us a view into different music, composers, sounds and instruments which make music both unique and universal. Today we will be talking to a Harrison Parrott marketing intern, Kerry Chen, all about Chinese pop music. So, Kerry, please tell us a bit more about yourself. Hi, my name is Kerry. I come from China and I'm a marketing assistant intern at Harrison Parrot. I'm also a music student from University of Leeds, so I play the piano, but I also compose some contemporary music. Fantastic. So, seeing as this is a speed podcast, we should jump straight into our big topic of Chinese pop music. So, Kerry, please tell us what is Chinese pop music? Okay, so Chinese pop music, we have a short for it. We call it C-pop around Asia. I think it was used to separate the different styles of popular music around Asia. Um, so for Korean pop music, it's called K-pop, and Japanese is J-pop. But C-pop doesn't only suggest the pop music of China mainland, but also all the Chinese-speaking countries and regions, like Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, and Malaysia. So on the C-pop, we also have Mandel pop, which is Mandarin-speaking pop music, Canto pop, Cantonese, and Taiwan pop, but mandu pop remains the most popular subject. And canton pop used to be very popular among Asia in the 20th century, but mandu pop was not so developed. But now, thanks to the influence from Korea and Japan, mandu pop finds its way to win the heart of the population. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that um, and uh, telling us more about what Chinese pop music actually is. So on to our next question. What has influenced modern Chinese pop music? I think the earliest C-pop was actually influenced by American jazz, but from the 21st century, Koreans and Japanese have developed a sophisticated strategy to promote pop music through idolizing artists. I'm sure you've heard of these type of groups, so the artists will always go through a manufactured star system of entertainment agencies where they will go through intensive trainings in dancing and singing, and they are kind of like the role model of the population. So all the young people look up to them because they're always on the stage, super beautiful, they sing well, they dance well, and they're like a shining star. <laughs> so famous examples could be BTS, um, Blackpink, XO, they used to be very famous. So they attracted a lot of fans, not only from the country, but also from around Asia and also the Western countries. So a couple of years later, China was like, why don't we use the same strategy to our artists? So now in China we have groups like TF Boys and Nine Percent. They dance and sing in the exactly same system like the Korean ones. They have tons of music videos made for them, attracting many fans who love their music for them and their dance and how they look. Very importantly, <laughs> <laughs> but usually those members of those groups are not specialized in music, so. They can dance and sing well, but then once they leave the group, they probably will not become a serious musician. Apart from the music they were getting from these groups, the C-pop industry also includes a lot of very talented songwriters. Unlike the idol groups, uh, we have people like Ethan Chen, Jay Cho, JJ Lin, Li Hong Wan, and many others. They often write their own music and lyrics associated with their experience and thoughts, and their fans love them for their music and talents. Not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so what are the main characteristics of Chinese pop music? Well, so the theme of those C-pop music is always about love. <laughs> Wait, I don't know why, but it's always about love. It could be both negative or positive. So the lyrics could be mourning about the breakup, or missing their partners, or showing off the relationship. Structurally, many Chinese pop songs tend to have a middle age section, I think it's not so common anymore in the Western pop music, but it's definitely an influence from the West. Uh, the speed of the songs is usually not so fast because we're talking about love here, we should not rush it, you know. <laughs> um, melodically, depends on the composers, but usually the hit sounds like to avoid the subdominant and the leading note, which makes the melody quite pentatonic. But harmonically, they are not so pentatonic anymore. They use classic pop song progressions draw heavily on chords 1, 4, 5, 6, sometimes on chord 3 as well. It's an unstable chord, well, Bach doesn't really like that much. <laughs> instrumentally, C-pop use Western instruments. So instrumentally, C-pop use Western music, 
A few more adventurous musicians might want to include a couple of traditional Chinese instruments, such as the zither or arhu, which is interesting to listen to because C pop itself is a fusion of pop music from everywhere. And if I have to find a West example of how C pop music sounds like, it's probably Ed Sheeran's Perfect. Have you heard of it? Yes, I have. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> it's about love. It's, it's kind of <laughs> slow, and the melody is pentatonic and has a very classic one six four five progression. How has media and technology in our modern age affected Chinese pop music? I think this is a very good question because these days I feel like the spread of pop music gets so much faster, and the music are so much more accessible and inclusive with this developing. Media age. So, with the support of the video platforms and social media, people like to use their eyes to listen to music. So everything is very visualized. Pop music always goes with dances, videos, even plotted stories sometimes in the music videos. So I think in general, the new media and technology really assisted the spread of pop music and also other content. Here we have to mention TikTok. TikTok became very popular since a couple of years ago. Now even in the Western world as well. And also with COVID, I mean, TikTok is on fire. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so the idea of watching short videos on mobile phones is affecting how people listen to music. There, there has been so many hit pop songs in China, and they became famous on TikTok mainly because people use that particular song over and over again for a particular video. So sometimes a certain type of video can only Use this particular sound because the first person who posted this video is using that sound. So everyone else who follows up and start to make the similar video will use the same sound. So when a sound is used as a background music in videos by many people over and over again, that sound become very popular very fast. So nowadays there are so many musicians, singers, songwriters who publish their music or covers on TikTok for people to listen to and also to use as background music. So now, without an agent or management team, some freelance musicians they can use these platforms to publish their music and gain popularity very fast. On the other hand, the new media could be a very good way to promote traditional culture in China. So, for example, in our upcoming virtual circle event, Peking Opera Sacrifice, the young generations in China they really don't know much about Peking Opera, except for a few ones. I mean, I have never listened to a Peking Opera. Even though I spent fifteen years of my life in China, so <laughs> what I was saying about sacrifice is the the actress, Wang Peiyu, she was really trying to take advantage of the digital media to introduce Peking Opera to young people, to make them fall in love with Peking Opera, and also to inherit it into the next generation. She uses social media and video platforms that young people use all the time to post short episodes of Peking Opera and knowledge is around it. Introduce it to young people in a funny and understandable way. Many many young people said that they really took an interest in Peking Opera after watching Wang Peiyu's videos. I think the development of media and technology is a great tool to spread knowledge and inherited traditional cultures. Please, could you tell us、um, a bit more about one particular Chinese musician who exemplifies Chinese pop music with some music recommendations? So in here, I have to mention Jay Chou. So he is a very unique figure in the Chinese pop music industry. He always likes to merge Eastern and Western influences and also modern or ancient subjects. So, for example, one of his most famous hit, "Love Before BC," it is a love story, of course, set in the context of ancient Babylon. Very poetic lyrics with lush melodies like that. And this has intrigued many young people to discover more about the history from three thousand years ago. So, and another example of his work is his porcelain, which is a song heavily influenced by the Chinese culture and the Chinese porcelain. So the lyrics is very poetic and focuses on the making and the artistic part of the porcelain. And the harmony is very pentatonic, and the song is combined with the love theme. And has been sung in a modern pop music style. He released a single last year called Mojito. It is a Latin-influenced piece featuring brass instruments like trombone and trumpet, and the music portrays like a Cuban lifestyle with the classic cars, historical streets, very very cheerful. I would really recommend to listen to Jay Chou's music because we can see a lot of cultural blend in pop music from his work. Fantastic. 
And now into our last segment of the podcast, and to allow our listeners to dive even deeper into C-pop music, Kerry, please give us your two book recommendations. Great. So my book recommendation would probably have less to do with music, but more to do with Chinese culture. If you want to know more about the culture and societies of 20th century China, I would recommend Mo Yan's book. He is the first Chinese ever to have won a Nobel Prize in literature, and his writing often sets stories in the older Chinese context, combining with social issues of his time. So, for example, his frog, or big breast and wide hips. But these books really portray Chinese women's social position in the 20th century, involving one-child policy and other political issues, which are very interesting to read. But if you are more interested in the 21st century China, I would recommend Guo Jingming's book. His Tiny Times, for example, set in modern Shanghai, tells a story of Shanghai rich people with a luxury lifestyle and messy relationships. He has received a lot of criticisms, but I think his works are good fit to the modern societies of China. So, Kerry, could you give us your album recommendation? For album, I would really recommend Jay Cho's album because we just talked about him, and then his album Fantasy. It was released 20 years ago, but nobody has ever got bored listening to it. This album has won numerous awards. Some people said that it's the best album of Jay Cho. Love from BC that we just talked about is from this album. So if you are interested in C-pop, you should really give it a go. <laughs> Perfect. And finally, your film recommendation. I would like to recommend a film with a very beautiful name. It's called You Are the Apple of My Eye. It's not really related to pop music in China, but as we just said that C-pop music are very love themed most of the time. And this kind of love that we see there is very different from the Western societies. It's not like that wild and that bold and open. So You Are the Apple of My Eye is one of the greatest romantic film in China at all times. So I would really recommend watching it to understand a bit more about this kind of subtle and pure love that Chinese musicians are writing into their music. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Kerry, for giving us your insights into C-pop music and into Chinese modern culture. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Kerry Chen was interviewed by me, Fiona Livingston. If you're interested in hearing more episodes from The Culture Bar, please subscribe.